Major Nolan Greer stood at attention on the bridge of the EN supercarrier a little dash of justice his eyes fixed on the vast expanse of stars beyond the reinforced viewports. The year was 2549, and humanity had long since outgrown the confines of Earth, spreading across the galaxy like dandelion seeds in the cosmic wind. Greer's weathered face betrayed little emotion, but his mind was racing. As the leader of the carrier's elite mechanized Marines unit, he knew that their current patrol of the outer colonies was more than just a routine mission. Tensions were high, and whispers of a new threat had been circulating through the ranks. At ease, Major Captain J.P. Jones said, approaching from behind, Any movement out there? Greer relaxed his posture slightly, turning to face the legendary captain. J.P. Jones was a direct descendant of John Paul Jones, the famous naval commander from the American Revolution. The captain carried himself with the same air of determination and courage that had defined his ancestors for centuries. Nothing yet, Captain Greer reported. Just the usual chatter from our allies on Proxima Centauri II. Jones nodded, his sharp eyes scanning the star-filled void. Let's hope it stays that way, but if trouble comes, we'll be ready. Greer couldn't help but feel a surge of confidence. The Jones family had been at the forefront of Earth's naval endeavors for generations, from sea to space. J.P. was a hero cut from the same cloth as his illustrious forebears. Greer's hand unconsciously moved to the neural interface at the base of his skull the link to his team's heavy armor. Each suit was a marvel of human engineering, a fusion of advanced materials and AI-driven systems that turned a single soldier into a walking tank. My team's ready, Captain. Whatever's coming, we'll face it head on. Jones clapped a hand on Greer's shoulder. I'd expect nothing less, Major. Your unit's reputation is nearly as storied as my family's. As if on cue, alarms blared throughout the ship. Greer's muscles tensed, years of training kicking in instantly. Unidentified vessels approaching from Sector 7, a young ensign called out, her voice steady despite the sudden tension. Jones's demeanor shifted instantly from casual to commanding. Looks like the calm's over, Major. Get your team ready. We might be adding another chapter to humanity's history books today. Greer nodded sharply and strode off the bridge, his mind already shifting into combat mode. As he made his way to the armory, he couldn't shake the feeling that this wasn't just another skirmish with pirates or overzealous alien merchants. The corridor buzzed with activity as crew members rushed to their stations. Greer's team was already assembled when he arrived, their faces a mix of anticipation and determination. All right, ladies and gentlemen, Greer addressed them, his voice carrying the weight of countless battles. We've got unknown boggies inbound. Could be nothing, could be the fight of our lives. Either way, we show them what Earth's finest are made of. As his team began suiting up, Greer caught sight of his own reflection in the polished surface of a nearby bulkhead. The lines on his face seemed deeper, the gray in his hair more pronounced. He'd seen humanity forge alliances with alien races that, while friendly, had never quite measured up to Earth's rapid advancements. He'd watched as human colonies spread further and further into the void. But something about this felt different. A premonition, perhaps, or just the instincts of a career soldier. Whatever was coming, Greer knew one thing for certain with leaders like Captain J.P. Jones at the helm, humanity would face it on its feet with the same courage and determination that had defined their species since the days of wooden ships and iron men. As the last piece of his armor clicked into place, Greer allowed himself a grim smile. The calm was over. Now it was time to weather the storm and add another tale of heroism to the long saga of human history. The bridge of the A Little Dash of Justice was a hurricane of controlled chaos. Major Nolan Greer stood beside Captain J.P. Jones, both men's eyes fixed on the massive holographic display dominating the center of the room. What in the hell are we looking at, Greer muttered, his voice barely audible over the frantic chatter of the bridge crew. Captain Jones leaned forward, his brow furrowed. Something we've never seen before, Major. The display showed a swarm of ships, unlike anything in humanity's database. They moved with an otherworldly grace, their hulls gleaming with a metal that seemed to absorb light rather than reflect it. Sir, a young lieutenant called out, her voice cracking slightly. 
We're receiving reports from the outer colonies. These ships, they're attacking everything in sight. Jones's jaw clenched. Patch me through to Earth Command, now. As the communications officer scrambled to establish a link, Greer felt a chill run down his spine. In all his years of service, he'd never seen the captain look so grim. This is Captain J.P. Jones of the EN supercarrier. A little dash of Justice Jones spoke, his voice steady despite the tension. We have a code black situation. I repeat, code black. Unknown hostile forces attacking outer colonies. The response was immediate. Captain Jones, this is Admiral White. We're receiving similar reports from across the sector. What's your assessment? Jones took a deep breath. Admiral, based on what we're seeing, this is no ordinary incursion. These ships, they're beyond anything we've encountered. I believe we're dealing with a full-scale invasion. The bridge fell silent, the weight of Jones's words hanging heavy in the air. Understood, Captain Admiral White replied after a moment. We're mobilizing the fleet. Hold your position and gather as much intel as you can. And Captain, good luck. As the communication ended, Jones turned to Greer. Major, I need your team ready for immediate deployment. We might need boots on the ground sooner than we thought. Greer nodded sharply. We'll be ready, sir. As he made his way off the bridge, alarms blared once again. This time, it was accompanied by a bone-chilling message. Attention all personnel. This is not a drill. Unknown hostile forces have breached our outer defenses. Prepare for imminent contact. Greer broke into a run, his mind racing. By the time he reached the armory, his team was already suiting up, their faces a mix of determination and barely concealed fear. Listen up, Greer barked, silencing the nervous chatter. We've got an unknown enemy knocking on our door. They've already hit some of our outer colonies, and now they're here. We don't know what we're up against, but I'll tell you this, whatever they are, they picked the wrong species to mess with. As his team finished suiting up, a transmission came through on all channels. The voice that spoke was unlike anything Greer had ever heard a grating, metallic sound that seemed to oscillate between frequencies. Attention, primitive life forms. We are the Goraz Empire, masters of countless galaxies. Your pitiful colonies have fallen. Your technology is now ours. Resistance is not only futile, it is illogical. Surrender, and you may yet serve a purpose in our grand design. Greer looked around at his team, seeing the same mix of anger and resolve in their eyes that he felt in his gut. Well, he said, hefting his plasma rifle, looks like the neighborhood just got a whole lot unfriendlier. But if these Goraz think humanity's going to roll over and play dead, they've got another thing coming. As the ship shuddered under the first impacts of enemy fire, Greer and his team moved out. The calm was well and truly over. The storm had arrived, and it bore the name of the Goraz Empire. The days following first contact with the Goraz Empire were a blur of constant battles and retreats. Major Nolan Greer and his team had been deployed on multiple missions, each one more harrowing than the last. Now, back aboard the a little dash of Justice Greer found himself in a strategy meeting with Captain J.P. Jones and other high-ranking officers. The situation is grim, ladies and gentlemen, Jones said his voice carrying the weight of sleepless nights and hard-fought engagements. Our outer colonies are falling one by one, and our alien allies. He paused, a flicker of disgust crossing his face. Well, they're not exactly living up to the term allies. A holographic display showed the current state of the galaxy. Red dots, representing Goraz-controlled systems, were spreading like a virus across the map. What about Earth Command, someone asked. What's our overall strategy? Jones sighed. Admiral White has given us broad discretion to act as we see fit. His exact words were, I chose you because you're the best. Now prove it. Greer couldn't help but feel a grudging respect for the Admiral's hands-off approach. In a crisis like this, micromanagement could be deadly. Sir, a young lieutenant interrupted, her face pale. We're receiving a transmission. It's... It's from the Goraz Imperial Council. The room fell silent as Jones nodded. Put it through. The holographic display flickered, replaced by the image of a Goraz. Its reptilian features were twisted into what might have been a sneer, 
though it was hard to tell with the cybernetic implants covering half its face. Humans, the creature's voice grated, a sound like metal scraping on stone. Your resilience is unexpected. Perhaps you are not as primitive as we first thought. We're full of surprises, Jones replied coolly. What do you want? The Goraz's machine eye flashed a few times as it focused. The Imperial Council has deliberated. We are prepared to offer you terms. Greer felt his fists clench involuntarily. Terms? After all the destruction they'd caused? We will cease our attack on your worlds, the Goraz continued. In exchange, you will surrender all of your technology to us. Your ship designs, your weapons, your industrial processes. Everything. And if we refuse, Jones asked, though they all knew the answer. Then we will take it by force, the Goraz said simply. You have seen but a fraction of our power. Agree to our terms, and you may yet survive to serve the Empire. The transmission cut off abruptly, leaving the room in stunned silence. Well, Greer said, breaking the tension, I guess asking them to pretty please go away isn't an option. A few nervous chuckles rippled through the room. Jones turned to his officers. I need options, people. We can't give them our tech, but we can't keep fighting like this either. Sir Greer spoke up, an idea forming. What if we gave them exactly what they asked for? Jones raised an eyebrow. Explain, Major. They want our best tech, Greer continued, a grim smile forming. Let's give it to them, all of it, at once. Understanding dawned on Jones's face. You're talking about? Greer nodded. Nuke, sir. Lots of them. We know the Garaz don't distinguish between military and civilian targets. They're all valid in their eyes. So we hit them everywhere Jones finished. A simultaneous strike on every Garaz controlled world we can reach. The room erupted in discussion, officers debating the ethics, the logistics, the potential fallout, both literal and political. Enough Jones's voice cut through the chaos. I don't like it any more than you do. But we're running out of options in time, he turned to his communications officer. Get me Admiral White. He needs to hear this. As the officer scrambled to establish a secure link, Greer caught Jones's eye. The captain gave him a slight nod, a silent acknowledgement of the weight of what they were proposing. Greer knew that if they went through with this plan, it would change everything. The galaxy would never be the same. But as he thought of the colonies they'd lost, the lives destroyed, he knew they had no choice. The Goraz had demanded Earth's best technology. They were about to get it, in the most devastating way possible. The mood aboard the A Little Dash of Justice was tense as Captain J.P. Jones and Major Nolan Greer waited for Admiral White's response. The bridge crew worked in near silence, the gravity of their proposed plan weighing heavily on everyone's minds. Finally, the comm crackled to life. Captain Jones, this is Admiral White. I've reviewed your proposal. Jones straightened, his voice steady. Your thoughts, sir. There was a long pause before White responded. It's a hell of a thing you're proposing, Captain. The kind of action we can't come back from. Yes, Sir Jones replied. We're aware of the implications. Are you White's voice was heavy? Because once we cross this line, we're not just fighting a war. We're potentially committing xenocide. Greer stepped forward. Admiral, if I may. We've seen what the Goraz do to occupied worlds. They're not just conquering their strip-mining entire planets, wiping out all life. It's xenocide either way. At least this way we have a chance. Another long pause. You're right, Major. Doesn't make it any easier, though White sighed. All right, you have my authorization. God help us all. As the communication ended, Jones turned to Greer. Well, Major, looks like your plan is a go. I hope you're ready for what comes next. Greer nodded grimly. As ready as anyone can be for something like this, sir. Over the next few days, Greer found himself in the thick of preparation. His team was tasked with some of the most dangerous missions planting nuclear devices on Goraz-occupied worlds, often right under the enemy's nose. 
During one such mission, Greer and his squad were pinned down in the ruins of what had once been a thriving human colony. The air was thick with dust and the acrid smell of plasma fire. Miles, how much longer Greer barked into his calm, ducking as a Goraz energy blast sizzled overhead. Almost there, Major came the strained reply. These alien systems are a bitch to hack. Greer risked a glance over his cover. The Goraz were advancing, their technological enhancements allowing them to shrug off injuries that should have killed it several times over. Cruz, Thompson, covering fire Greer ordered. Everyone else, fall back to the extraction point. Move. As his team retreated, Greer couldn't help but take in the devastation around him. This planet had once been home to millions. Now it was a wasteland, its resources being systematically stripped away by the Goraz war machine. It's done Miles's triumphant voice came through. Nuke is armed and tied into their power grid. When it blows, it'll take out half the continent. Good work, Greer replied, his voice hollow. Now get the hell out of there. As they raced back to their stealth shuttle, weaving through Goraz patrols, Greer's mind was in turmoil. The weight of what they were doing what he had proposed was almost unbearable. Back on the Justice, Greer gave his report to Captain Jones. The captain listened silently, his face a mask of stoic determination. We've planted charges on 17 Goraz-controlled worlds, Greer concluded. That's in addition to the long-range missiles we've prepared. When we strike, it'll hit them everywhere at once. Jones nodded slowly. Good work, Major. I know this hasn't been easy. Greer hesitated, then spoke. Sir, I, I can't help but wonder. Are we any better than them doing this? Jones turned to look out at the stars. I've been asking myself the same thing, Nolan. But then I remember what I saw in Proxima Centauri III. The Goraz don't just conquer, they consume. Entire species, whole ecosystems, gone in a matter of weeks. He turned back to Greer, his eyes hard. We're not just fighting for humanity anymore. We're fighting for every race that can't fight for itself. Greer straightened, nodding. You're right, sir. It doesn't make it easier, but you're right. As he left the bridge, Greer's resolve hardened. The choice had been made. Now, all that was left was to see it through. The Goraz had demanded Earth's best technology. They were about to receive it in a way they never expected. The war room of the A Little Dash of Justice was packed to capacity. Officers from every department crowded around the central holographic display, their faces a mix of determination and apprehension. Major Nolan Greer stood at attention beside Captain J.P. Jones, both men's eyes fixed on the swirling galaxy map before them. Ladies and gentlemen, Jones began, his voice cutting through the nervous chatter. What we're about to do will change the course of human history. Hell, it'll change the course of galactic history, he paused, his gaze sweeping the room. I won't sugarcoat it. This is an act of desperation. But it's also our best chance at survival. Greer stepped forward, tapping a control on the holographic interface. Red dots representing Goraz-controlled worlds blinked into existence across the map. Thanks to the efforts of our covert ops teams, Greer said, nodding to several grim-faced officers, we've managed to place nuclear devices on 17 key Goraz worlds. Additionally, we have long-range missiles aimed at another 32 targets. A low murmur rippled through the crowd. The scale of what they were about to do was staggering. Our plan, Jones continued, is to detonate all of these simultaneously. The Goraz's hive mind-like communication network, which has been their greatest strength, will become their undoing. They won't be able to process the sudden, massive loss of life and resources. But sir, a young lieutenant spoke up, her voice wavering slightly. What about the other species on those worlds? The ones the Goraz have enslaved. A heavy silence fell over the room. It was the question they'd all been grappling with, the moral weight that had been crushing them all. Jones's face was grim as he replied, we've done everything we can to target Goraz military and industrial centers, but there will be collateral damage. It's unavoidable. Greer watched the faces of the officers around him. He saw the same conflict he felt mirrored in their eyes. The burden of this decision would haunt them all for years to come.
remember. Greer added, his voice firm, the Goraz don't differentiate between military and civilian targets. Every world they take, they strip bare. Every species they encounter, they enslave or eradicate. This isn't just about saving humanity anymore. It's about giving the galaxy a fighting chance. Jones nodded, gratitude in his eyes for Greer's support. Major Greer will be leading the strike team. They'll be responsible for coordinating the simultaneous detonation from our forward command post on Theta Epsilon. Greer stepped forward again, pulling up a new display. We'll be using a network of quantum entangled communicators to ensure simultaneous detonation. Each team has been given a failsafe code. If anything goes wrong, if there's even a hint that the Goraz have discovered our plan, you hit that failsafe. We cannot allow them to trace this back to Earth. The room was silent as the weight of responsibility settled on each person's shoulders. We launch in six hours, Jones said finally. Get to your stations, and may God have mercy on our souls. As the officers filed out, Greer felt a hand on his shoulder. He turned to see Jones, looking older than Greer had ever seen him. Nolan Jones said quietly, I need you to promise me something. Anything, sir. Jones's eyes were intense. If this goes sideways, if it looks like we've failed, I need you to make sure the Goraz never find out where we came from. Earth has to be protected at all costs. Greer understood the unspoken order. If the mission failed, he was to ensure that no evidence remained, including themselves. He nodded solemnly. I understand, sir. It won't come to that. But if it does, I'll do what needs to be done. As Greer left to prepare his team, he couldn't shake the feeling that they were standing on the precipice of something monumental. In a few short hours, they would either save the galaxy or doom themselves to be remembered as monsters. The plan was unfolding. The die had been cast, and the fate of countless worlds now rested in their hands. The stealth shuttle cut through the inky blackness of space, its advanced cloaking technology rendering it invisible to both eyes and sensors. Inside, Major Nolan Greer and his elite team sat in tense silence, each lost in their own thoughts, as they approached their destination Theta Epsilon, a small moon that would serve as their forward command post. Greer looked around at his team men and women he'd fought beside for years, faces etched with determination and the weight of their mission. They were the best humanity had to offer, and today they carried the fate of entire worlds on their shoulders. Two minutes to touch down the pilot's voice crackled over the comm. Greer stood, steadying himself against the shuttle's bulkhead, all right, people, you know the drill. We get in, we set up the quantum comm array, and we coordinate the biggest fireworks show this galaxy has ever seen. His attempt at levity fell flat, met with grim nods from his team. As the shuttle touched down on the barren surface of Theta Epsilon, Greer's mind flashed back to his last conversation with Captain Jones. Remember, Nolan Jones had said, his voice heavy with the burden of command, once you're planet side, you're on your own. We can't risk any communication that might give away your position. Greer had nodded. Understood, sir. Radio silence until it's time to light the fuse. Now, as they disembarked onto the moon's dusty surface, that silence felt oppressive. The only sounds were the crunch of their boots and the low hum of their equipment. Miles, Cruz, get that array set up, Greer ordered. Thompson, Jackson, perimeter sweep. I want to know the moment anything so much as twitches on this rock. As his team moved with practice deficiency, Greer made his way to a nearby ridge. From this vantage point, he could see the looming bulk of a Goraz warship in orbit around the nearby planet. So close, yet unaware of the doom that awaited them. Major Miles's voice came through his helmet comm. Array is online. We're ready to sync up with the other teams. Greer took a deep breath. This was it. Do it. For several tense minutes, there was nothing but the sound of Miles's fingers flying over his portable terminal. Then, a soft beep. We're linked, Sir Miles reported. All teams are in position. We're go for simultaneous detonation. Greer felt a chill run down his spine. In that moment, the weight of what they were about to do hit him full force. With a few simple commands, they were about to wipe out billions of lives. Goraz, yes, but also countless enslaved species caught in the crossfire. 
Sir Miles's voice pulled him back to the present. We're awaiting your command. Greer closed his eyes for a moment, steeling himself. When he opened them, his resolve was iron. Initiate countdown. Ten minutes. As Miles relayed the command, Greer's mind raced. Ten minutes. Ten minutes until they changed the course of galactic history. Ten minutes until they crossed a line that could never be uncrossed. Suddenly, alarms blared from Miles's terminal. Major, we've got incoming. Multiple Goraz ships just dropped out of FTL. Greer's blood ran cold. How many? At least a dozen, sir. They're heading straight for us. For a split second, Greer considered aborting the mission, but he knew they'd never get another chance like this. Maintain countdown, he barked. Everyone, prepare for combat. We hold this position at all costs. As his team scrambled to defensive positions, Greer could see the Goraz ships descending through the thin atmosphere. They'd been discovered, but it was too late for the Goraz to stop what was coming. With plasma fire raining down around them and enemy drop ships approaching fast, Greer gritted his teeth. They were in the lion's den now, with the fate of the galaxy hanging in the balance. All they had to do was survive long enough to push the button. The final countdown had begun, and with it, the most desperate battle of their lives. The surface of Theta Epsilon had become a war zone. Plasma fire crisscrossed the dusty landscape as Major Nolan Greer and his team fought desperately against the descending Goraz forces. The air was filled with the acrid smell of ozone and the deafening roar of energy weapons. Three minutes to detonation, Miles' voice crackled over the comm, strained but determined. Greer ducked behind a rocky outcropping, narrowly avoiding a barrage of enemy fire. Status on the quantum array, he shouted, returning fire with his plasma rifle. Still operational, Sir Miles replied. But we're taking heavy fire. I don't know how long we can hold them off. Greer gritted his teeth. They were so close. They couldn't fail now, not when they were on the brink of turning the tide against the Goraz Empire. Cruz, Thompson, Concentrate fire on those drop ships Greer ordered. We can't let them land more troops. As his team redoubled their efforts, Greer saw a Goraz soldier charging towards their position, its cybernetic enhancements allowing it to shrug off shots that would have felled any human. Greer lined up his sights and fired, the high-powered plasma bolt finally dropping the alien. Two minutes Miles called out. The Goraz attacks were intensifying. They might not know exactly what the humans were planning, but they clearly sensed the urgency of the moment. Suddenly, a massive explosion rocked their position. Greer was thrown to the ground, his ears ringing. As he struggled to his feet, he saw Jackson lying motionless nearby, a smoking crater where their defensive perimeter had been. Miles. Status Greer yelled, desperation creeping into his voice. For a heart-stopping moment, there was no response. Then, Array. Array's still online, sir, but we've lost the eastern perimeter. They're closing in. Greer made a split-second decision. Fall back to the central position. Form a tight perimeter around the Array. This is it, people. We hold the line here. As the remaining members of his team regrouped, Greer saw the full might of the Goraz assault bearing down on them. Drop ships were landing en masse now, disgorging waves of cybernetically enhanced soldiers. One minute Miles' voice was barely a whisper now. Greer looked at the faces of his team bloodied, exhausted, but unwavering. They all knew what was at stake. Whatever happens, Greer said, his voice carrying to each of them, it's been an honor serving with you. For Earth. For all of us. The final minute stretched into an eternity. The world narrowed to the rhythm of breath, the squeeze of a trigger, the fall of another enemy. Greer lost track of how many Goraz he'd killed, how many times he'd narrowly escaped death. Ten seconds Miles' voice cut through the chaos. Greer allowed himself a moment to think of home, of all they were fighting for. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. A blinding light filled Greer's visor, forcing him to look away. For a moment all was silent. Then, a massive shockwave knocked them all off their feet. 
As Greer's vision cleared, he saw the Goraz soldiers stumbling, their movements erratic. Some fell to the ground, clutching their heads as if in great pain. Did. Did it work, Cruz asked, her voice filled with awe and terror. Miles's laughter, tinged with hysteria and relief, came over the comm. It worked. All targets hit simultaneously. The Goraz network, it's going haywire. They can't process the sudden loss. Greer watched in astonishment as the mighty Goraz army before them fell into disarray. Without their hive mind to coordinate them, they were little more than advanced foot soldiers, confused and disoriented. Suddenly, an idea struck him. Team, this might be our only chance. Let's grab one of them. Sir Thompson's voice was uncertain. You want to capture a Goraz? Affirmative Greer replied. We need intel, and a live specimen could be invaluable. Move fast, people. The team sprang into action. Cruz and Thompson provided covering fire while Greer and Miles approached the nearest disoriented Goraz soldier. The alien was on its knees, its mechanical implants sparking and twitching. As they got closer, Greer could see the confusion in the Goraz's organic eye. The creature looked up at them, and for a moment Greer saw something he never expected to see in a Goraz fear. Easy now, Greer said, more to his team than to the alien. Miles, get those restraints ready. With practiced efficiency, they secured the Goraz. The alien offered no resistance, still reeling from the shock of losing its connection to the hive mind. Package secure, Greer reported. Let's move out before they regroup. As they retreated to their shuttle, Goraz in tow, the comm crackled to life with a familiar voice. Greer? Greer, do you copy? This is Captain Jones. Report your status. Greer took a deep breath, looking at his team, their captive, and then out at the chaos before him the disabled Goraz forces, the burning wreckage of their ships, and the determination on the faces of his surviving team members. Mission accomplished, Captain Greer replied, his voice heavy with the weight of their actions. We've given them our best technology, just as they asked. And we've got a little bonus one live Goraz soldier for study, requesting immediate extraction. Well done, Major Jones responded, a mix of relief and concern in his voice. Extraction team is on its way. And Greer, brace yourself. The galaxy's never going to be the same after this. As the sun rose over the horizon of Theta Epsilon, casting long shadows across the battlefield, Greer knew that Jones was right. The age of the Goraz Empire was over, and humanity, for better or worse, had written its name in the stars with fire and fury. Now, with their Goraz prisoner, they had a chance to understand their enemy better than ever before. Greer couldn't shake the feeling that this was just the beginning of a new chapter in this interstellar conflict. The extraction shuttle hummed quietly as it sped through space, carrying Major Nolan Greer and his team back to the a little dash of justice in the cargo hold. Their Goraz prisoner lay sedated, securely restrained and monitored by watchful guards. Greer sat in silence, his mind replaying the events on Theta Epsilon. The desperate fight, the blinding flash of the nukes, the confused Goraz soldiers. It all felt surreal now. Sir Miles's voice broke through his thoughts. You might want to see this. Greer moved to the shuttle's main view screen, where Miles had patched in a feed from Earth Command. The sight took his breath away. Across the galaxy map, red dots representing Goraz-controlled worlds were blinking out one by one. In their place, chaos symbols appeared, indicating zones of confusion and disarray. My God, Cruz whispered. We really did it. Greer nodded grimly. We did but it's not over yet. As if in answer to his statement, the feed switched to show the aftermath on one of the targeted Goraz worlds. The devastation was beyond anything Greer had imagined. Entire continents were scorched, cities reduced to ash. In the background, a news anchor's voice solemnly reported on the unprecedented strike against the Goraz Empire's forces in our galaxy. ETA to just as five minutes the pilot's voice came over the intercom breaking the tense silence. Captain J.P. Jones was waiting for them in the hangar bay, his face a mask of complex emotions. Welcome back, Major. Good work out there. Greer managed a nod. Thank you, sir. 
but I have a feeling this is far from over. Jones's eyes flickered to the sedated Goraz. You have no idea. Our xenobiologists have been working overtime. The intel we've gathered from your guest is game-changing. My ready room now. As they walked, Jones filled Greer in on the bigger picture. The strike was effective, but not in the way we initially thought. The Goraz fleet in our galaxy is in disarray, yes, but we've learned something crucial this was just an expeditionary force. Greer felt a chill run down his spine. What do you mean, sir? They entered Jones's ready room, and the captain pulled up a holographic display of a galaxy, but not the Milky Way. This, Major, is the Goraz home galaxy. An entire galaxy under their control, populated solely by Goraz warriors. No subjects, no slaves, just an empire of soldiers. Greer's mind reeled at the implications. So what we hit was just the tip of the iceberg Jones finished. We've bloodied their nose, but the real fight hasn't even begun. A beep from the comm system interrupted them. Captain Sir, a voice came through. We're receiving a priority transmission from Admiral White. He's ordering all fleet captains to converge at Earth immediately. Jones acknowledged the order, then turned back to Greer. There's more. Thanks to the data we extracted from your prisoner and some brilliant work by our intel teams, we've managed to pinpoint the location of the Goraz Imperial Council. Greer's eyes widened. In their home galaxy. Jones nodded, a grim smile on his face. Exactly. It's not over, Nolan. Not by a long shot. But for the first time, we have a real chance to strike at the heart of the Goraz Empire. As the justice turned towards Earth, Greer felt a mix of dread and determination. They had won a battle, but the war was far from over. The true challenge facing an entire galaxy of Goraz warriors was just beginning. What now? Sir Greer asked quietly. Jones looked out at the stars streaking by. Now, Major, now we prepare. We've shown the galaxy what humanity is capable of. And we've given the Goraz a taste of our best technology, but make no mistake, this is just the beginning. As the ship accelerated towards Earth, Greer realized that the true fallout of their actions was only just beginning to manifest. They had changed the course of the war, but at a cost they were only starting to understand. The Goraz Empire had demanded their best technology, and now they would face the full might of human ingenuity and determination. It wouldn't be long before humanity showed the Goraz even more technology, as per their request. The vastness of space seemed to hold its breath as the combined fleets of humanity gathered at the edge of the Milky Way. Major Nolan Greer stood on the bridge of the A Little Dash of Justice watching as ships of all sizes took their positions in the massive formation. Captain J.P. Jones stepped up beside him, his face set in grim determination. Quite a sight, isn't it, Major? Greer nodded. Yes, sir. The largest fleet humanity has ever assembled. And hopefully the last time we'll need to, Jones replied. Are you ready for one final technology exchange with our Goraz friends? Despite the gravity of the situation, Greer couldn't help but smile at the dark humor. Ready as will ever be, sir. Admiral White's face appeared on the main view screen, addressing the entire fleet. Men and women of Earth's united forces, today we make our stand. The Goraz demanded our best technology. Well, they're about to get more than they bargained for. A hush fell over the bridge as White continued. Our scientists have perfected the experimental wormhole technology. We will be able to deliver our payload directly to key targets across the Goraz home galaxy. Our missiles, nukes, and experimental warheads are primed and ready. Greer felt a chill run down his spine. This was it, the culmination of humanity's fight for survival. All ships, prepare for wormhole jump on my Mark White ordered. Three, two, one, Mark. The fabric of space itself seemed to tear as thousands of wormholes opened before the fleet. Greer watched in awe as missiles streaked forward, disappearing into the swirling vortexes. First wave away, Jones reported. Wormholes are stable. Payload delivery in progress. Across the bridge, officers called out status reports as waves of missiles continued to pour through the wormholes. Conventional nukes, antimatter warheads, 
gravity bombs humanity was unleashing its entire arsenal. Sir, a young lieutenant called out, we're getting telemetry from the other side. Impacts confirmed across multiple sectors of the Goraz galaxy. The bridge erupted in cheers, but Greer remained focused. This was more than a victory, it was an extinction-level event for an entire galaxy. As the last of the missiles disappeared through the wormholes, an eerie silence fell over the fleet. They had done it. They had struck at the very heart of the Goraz Empire. Wormholes closing miles reported. All payloads delivered. Jones turned to Greer, his expression a mix of relief and uncertainty. And now we wait. Hours passed as the fleet held position, monitoring for any sign of Goraz retaliation. But as time wore on, it became clear the strike had been devastatingly effective. Finally, Admiral White addressed the fleet again. Preliminary reports confirm widespread destruction across the Goraz home galaxy. The Imperial Council has been eliminated. The Goraz threat has been neutralized. A wave of emotion swept through the bridge relief, disbelief, and a sobering realization of the scale of what they had just done. Greer turned to Jones. Sir, what now? Jones looked out at the stars, his voice quiet. Now, Major, we rebuild. We help those we can. And we make damn sure nothing like this ever happens again. As the fleet began its journey home, Greer couldn't help but reflect on the cost of their victory. They had saved their galaxy, yes, but at what price? The weight of an entire civilization's destruction would be theirs to bear. Yet as Earth came into view, a fragile blue marble in the vastness of space, Greer felt a glimmer of hope. Humanity had faced its greatest threat and emerged victorious. They had showcased ingenuity, determination, and a willingness to push the boundaries of technology to defend not just themselves, but all sentient life in their galaxy. The Goras had demanded Earth's best technology. In the end, they had received a demonstration of humanity's greatest strengths adaptability, resourcefulness, and a seemingly endless capacity for destruction. Peace had its price. Thank you so much for listening to this story. I hope you loved it. Please remember to subscribe if you did like it so you can see more videos like this. And please give us a like and a comment too. I'll see you in the next one.